Good afternoon everyone and a very warm welcome to all who have joined us today to learn about managing safety under the new chain of responsibility requirements. There's a few of you just logging in at the moment. The webinar is due to start at 12.30 for those who are asking. Um, so we might just get into a bit of housekeeping while we're waiting for everybody else to join on the line. Our webinar today is presented by Julia Collins, who joined that road in January 2017 as the Industry Policy Advisor. Julia has 20 years of experience in work health and safety policy, regulation and compliance. She has held senior leadership positions in Safe Work Australia and played a key role in harmonisation of Australia's WHS laws, including developing numerous national codes of practice on a wide range of work and health safety issues. Sorry. This webinar is part of NatRoad's Chain of Responsibility webinar series. It's designed to help your business get a head start in preparing for the introduction of Chain of Responsibility laws in mid-2018. We'll be aiming for a presentation of around 30 minutes today and we'll be recording the webinar, so don't worry, you don't need to frantically take notes. Um, the slides will also be made available to everybody in attendance following the webinar. Other downloads are also available to you once the webinar has concluded. My name is Renee Ryan and I'll be your webinar moderator today. So if you experience any issues, please send them through to me to assist. My email is up there on the screen or you can also send questions through the, through the webinar system. Today's webinar is sponsored by P BP who is a platinum partner of NatRoad. I'll just quickly draw your attention to the control panel today where you'll see a question box. If you do have any questions for Julia today, please don't be shy, type them into the question box and we're going to address them all at the end of the presentation. I'm just going to give it another minute or two to um, welcome some more participants on the line because we've got most people on at the moment and then I'll hand over to Julia. All right, it is 12.30, so we will be starting the webinar now. So without further ado, I warmly welcome Julia Collins. Julia, to set the scene, can you tell our viewers today about what we already know about the road transport safety performance? Thanks very much, Renee, and welcome to everybody um, that's participating in this webinar. I hope you'll get something useful out of it. The national statistics from Safe Work Australia show that over the last 15 years the rates of injuries and fatalities in the road transport have in the road transport industry have reduced. So you can see there's been a 34% decrease over the years in the rate of fatalities and a 27% reduction in serious claims. So these are workers' compensation injury claims. However, it still remains a high risk industry with injury and fatality rates substantially higher than the all industry average. So Although the road transport industry accounts for 2% of the Australian workforce, it accounted for 17% of work-related fatalities and 4% of serious workers' compensation claims in 2014-15. And certainly in the most recent years, um, we've actually found that the injury and fatality rate is, is sort of flat lining and even in some cases sort of starting to go up again. So, we certainly need to continue to pay attention to uh, health and safety in our industry. It's certainly no surprise that the main cause of death is vehicle collisions. So you can see 77% of fatalities have been caused by vehicle collisions and then that's followed by being hit by moving or falling objects. About one in five fatalities occur when doing things other than driving. So this is often due to a failure to mobilise the truck or trailer during loading or unloading or when doing maintenance work. The main causes of injury not resulting in death, so there's 43% of muscular stress, so when people are lifting, pushing, pulling things, 
and then that's followed by slips, trips and falls and being hit by moving objects. Julia, can you tell our viewers today what is changing under the Heavy Vehicle National Law? So the current Heavy Vehicle National Law already recognises that the responsibility for safety is shared between various parties in the supply chain and that it's not always the driver at fault. What is changing is that a number of the existing chain of responsibility provisions that are being consolidated um, into a single broad duty. So that's being called the primary duty. So what that means, for example, is that the whole chapter on speeding in the Heavy Vehicle National Law is being replaced with a primary duty, which is now risk-based, not outcome-based. So that means that it no longer requires a road offence to be committed for a party to be to be found in breach of the duty. So you could have an inspector come into your workplace and look at your systems of work and they could very well find that if you're not complying um, in your safety management system then you could be in breach. So it's, it's a very broad duty, very similar to the work health and safety um, general duty of care. The other thing that's changing is the burden of proof returns to the prosecution. So whereas currently the defendant must prove that they took reasonable steps, this will have more of an impact on how regulators investigate potential offences. So um, the Heavy Vehicle National Law now includes some um, increased powers for uh, inspectors to collect information and request documents to, to assist them in investigating chain of responsibility offences. There's also uh, penalties for failure to comply with the primary duty. They will um, be much more, much higher than what they currently are. So up to $3 million for the most serious offences involving recklessness. Currently the maximum penalty is um, $10,000 in the heavy vehicle national law. So that's a significant increase. The duties and penalties will align more closely with the work health and safety laws. So where the heavy vehicle national law focus on the use of a heavy vehicle on a road, work health and safety laws include all other health and safety risks. So this means that you can now manage these risks in the same way. So at this starting point, we need to understand what the new duty in the heavy vehicle national law requires. So it states that each party in the chain of responsibility for a heavy vehicle must ensure, so far as reasonably practical, the safety of the party's transport activities relating to the vehicle, including by eliminating public risks and to the extent it's not reasonably practical to do so, minimise the public risks. And ensuring the party does not directly or indirectly cause or encourage the driver of the heavy vehicle or another person to contravene the heavy vehicle national law or the driver to exceed the speed limit. So this means that each party in the chain must proactively identify hazards related to the transport activity and remove or reduce the risks as much as possible instead of only taking action when something goes wrong. It means that there will now be more focus on the systems you have in place to manage risk. There's also a separate provision which says that a person, so any person, must not in any way require a driver or a party in the chain of responsibility to do or not do something the person knows or should know would cause the driver to exceed the speed limit or breach fatigue rules. So this primary duty includes four key concepts which are highlighted in this slide and they are separately defined in the heavy vehicle national law it's, and it's important to understand what their definition is. So they are the party in the chain of responsibility, so these are the duty holders, reasonably practicable which is the standard of care, the transport activities, so these are all the activities relating to operating a heavy vehicle, and public risk. So public risk means the risk of harm to people as well as damage to infrastructure. So who are the parties in the chain? The parties who the duty applies to are those on the slide, and they're the same people who currently have chain of responsibility um, duty. So the definition of the party in the chain actually hasn't changed. So a person may be a party in the chain in more than one way. So for example, um, they may have duties as an, as an employer of a driver, they may be the operator of a vehicle, and they may also be the scheduler. 
More than one person can also have a duty for the same activity. So, for example, loading a truck, you could have various parties being responsible for that. The extent of each party's duty depends on what they actually do. So rather than their job title or functions described in a contract, the nature of the risk created by the transport activity and also the party's capacity to eliminate or reduce that risk. So what is meant by transport activities? So each party must ensure the safety of their transport activities. And the definition of transport activity is broad, so it includes business practices and making decisions associated with the use of a heavy vehicle on a road. So again, this comes back to looking more broadly at the systems you have in place. And it will include activities such as contracting or employing a person to drive a vehicle, maintaining or repairing a vehicle, consigning goods for transport, managing the loading of goods, and even things such as securing a vehicle. And given that that's quite a topical issue uh, with the recent incident we had in Singleton last week. So what does reasonably practicable mean? The reasonably practicable standard of care has been used in work health and safety laws for a long time and has been consistently interpreted by the courts in work health and safety prosecutions. It recognises that the wide range of situations that exist in workplaces and that sometimes it's not possible to eliminate all risk. So when deciding whether you've done everything reasonably practicable, a court will consider and weigh up various factors. So these are the likelihood of the risk occurring and the degree of harm it may cause, and they will balance this with what the person knows or should have known about the risk, ways to remove or reduce the risk and whether they are feasible, and the cost and whether it's proportional to the risk. So in relation to cost, if, if you have a, a, a very minor risk, um, you won't be expected to spend a huge amount of money, time and effort um, to actually control that risk. But it doesn't mean that you, you, you shouldn't be doing anything. It might mean that your control measure might be a less expensive control measure. So the more likely the risk or damage and the greater the harm that may result, the more you will be expected to do. Under the Heavy Vehicle National Law and the Work Health and Safety Laws, COVID practice can be used by a court as evidence of what is known about a hazard or risk and how to control it. So it's very important that you are aware of what is in COVID practice and there are currently being um, a number of codes uh, being developed under the Heavy Vehicle National Law which will assist um, in compliance. Courts will look at other relevant matters, so for example, whether there's le other legislation that requires or prohibits certain activities and therefore limits what you can do. So obviously there are Australian role, road rules which you need to comply with, there are environmental laws and other laws. So these will also impact on um, what is reasonably practical in those circumstances. And then the extent of your capacity to control or influence a safety outcome. So if we look at an example of a loading manager, um, they may not be able to directly control the maintenance of the vehicles that come into their distribution centre, but they can influence the use of defective or unsafe vehicles on the road. So if they see a potentially dangerous condition on a vehicle, they should report the issue to the responsible transport operator. So in this case, their role is one of observe, report and record. The more control or influence you have over the transport activity, the more you will be expected to do to ensure safety. Julia, can you give our viewers today an example of how the chain of responsibility duties work in practice? So if we just take an example um, of a transport business that has a contract to pick up a sealed shipping container from a port and deliver it to a manufacturing facility, when leaving the port, the driver notices the load inside the container shift and becomes concerned of the stability of the vehicle. So what are the chain of responsibility roles in relation to loads? So you can see on the slide there that, that there are various chain of responsibility parties and that they have a number of overlapping um, duties in relation to load restraint. So packers, for example, and in this case the packer would be the OSC supplier, has to ensure that goods are properly secured. The loaders, which in this case are the stevedores, have a duty. Loading managers, which would be the port, would have a duty. Consigners, in this case it's a manufacturing facility in 
supporting the goods, who's the consigner, has a duty, and the transport operator as well. So um, the transport operator must ensure that the loads on their trucks can be transported safely. So load restraint is obviously one of the things that they must consider. The party with the most control in how the load is secured, in this example inside the container, is the packer, but they're a supplier overseas. The loaders putting the container in the truck also have a key role that the container is to remain sealed until it gets to the manufacturing facility. And the consigner is responsible for goods in the container. So what's reasonably practicable for each of those parties to do? So each of these people can influence or control proper load restraint in some way. The driver reports the issue to the transport business before continuing the journey. The transport business discusses the issue with the consigner, who then allows the container to be opened to find that a large item of freight was fully restrained and had moved. The consigner instructs their supplier overseas on what is required under the Australian Load Restraint Guide and asks for evidence of compliance prior to shipment. So, for example, they could request that an engineer check the load restraint and also that photographs of are provided. The consigner and transporter then agree to amend their contract to include that the consigner provides this evidence to the transport company and allows regular spot checks of containers to be conducted. Clearly managing safety risks will be very important in meeting chain of responsibility duties. How should a business go about this? So the chain of responsibility duty and the definition of reasonably practicable embodies the risk management process. So they are really the same thing. In its simplest form, it involves identifying what could cause harm or damage. So these are identifying the hazards and that could be anything from poorly restrained loads, unrealistic schedules, working at height, strenuous manual tasks, driver distraction, exposure to things such as diesel fumes or other chemicals, noise, vibration, heat. And obviously some hazards will cause more harm than others. You then need to just assess the likelihood of this harm occurring and how serious the consequences could be. So this is what's called assessing risks and it will help you decide whether something is a high, medium or low risk and what to do about it. Now risk assessment processes don't have to be complex um, for very complex hazards, they may be, but generally it can be a very quick process of deciding um, whether it's a high, medium or low risk. And often you will know straight away um, what you need to do about it. The longer or more frequently a person is exposed to hazard, the more likely it is that harm or damage could occur. And then the third step is implementing suitable control measures to eliminate or minimise the risk. So obviously that's the most important step. And then you need to review whether your control measures work. So risk management is not something you do once and forget. It's a continuous process because hazards and risks can change frequently. And this is particularly the case in the transport industry. And there may also be new, more effective ways of controlling risks. So there are various ways to um, identify hazards and assess risks. The most important one is to talk to those people who do the job and involve them in finding ways to make their job safer. There's been lots of research that shows that businesses in, who involve workers in their health and safety systems um, and in identifying hazards and assessing risks will have much better um, safety outcomes. It's also important to look at how the work is actually done. So you may have procedures in place, but they are ineffective if workers don't follow them. Often people will take shortcuts or they might become a bit complacent. There's also obviously inspecting um, things that you use in the workplace for vehicles, load restraints and other equipment used in your transport activity. You should also be checking documents such as work diaries, contracts and agreements. Review your incident reports, your near misses, sick leave and results of any investigations or vehicle inspections. Obtain information from regulators, industry associations, um, technical specialists, manufacturers and suppliers of equipment. And you can also talk to other people who work in your industry. So first focus on the transport activity that you're directly responsible for and the risks associated with those. 
So clearly under the heavy vehicle national law, you've got your vehicle, you've got the load, you've got the routes, the journey that you're going to go on, um, the delivery um, areas and the drop, the pickup areas, and your drivers, and then you've got your chain of responsibility parties. So all of these things will interact with each other. Look at how other parties are influencing the safety of these activities. So there is usually more than one way to control a risk. The hierarchy of control ranks these ways from most effective to least effective. Again, this is a very uh, familiar concept under work health and safety laws, so you may already um, know what this is about. You always need to choose the most effective control measure or set of control measures that is reasonably practicable in your circumstances. So in situations where the laws don't prescribe exactly what you need to do, you do have flexibility in looking at ways to control the risk, but you always need to start at the top. So because if it's reasonably practicable for you to completely eliminate or remove a hazard, then you will be expected to do so. So for example, there are various ways <coughs> excuse me, to control the risk of falls when working at height, such as guardrails, temporary work platforms, fall arrest systems. But the best way to do the work is from the ground. So for example, using tarp spreaders for tarping loads to avoid climbing onto a vehicle. But in some cases, it may not be possible to eliminate a hazard <coughs> if it means you can't actually reduce, um, if you can't actually do the job. So then there are various ways you can reduce exposure to the hazard and you can see those on the slide there with some, some examples. So you would then look at substituting with something safer, isolating the hazard from people, so in cases of um, separating pedestrians from moving vehicles using physical barriers, using engineering control, so these would be things like speed limiters, um, onboard mass monitoring devices um, and uh, trolleys and mechanical devices to move loads. Then you have administrative measures, so things like work diaries, written procedures, um, training, uh, warning signs, and then also finally personal protective equipment, so things such as high visibility um, vests and, and hard hats. Admin controls and PPE, so personal protective equipment, relies on human behaviour and supervision to be effective. So so that's why these are the, you know, at the bottom of the, the hierarchy, um, because they really are ineffective if you if you don't make sure that people are doing things properly. Often um, you will use a combination of controls. So in case of um, uh, an area where you have traffic management issues, you will perhaps be ensuring that people wear high visibility vests, but you will also um, look at in um, putting traffic barriers um, in place. So um, isolating the hazard and, as, as, and using perhaps warning signs and written procedures. So the more likely the risk or damage and the greater the harm that may result, the higher the level of control required. Of course, as I said, the Heavy Vehicle National Law has specific rules for vehicle mass, dimension, load restraint and fatigue and those must be complied with as a minimum. So Julia, apart from managing safety risks, what else will chain of responsibility duty actually require? So you will be unable to meet the primary chain of responsibility duty without working with the other parties in your supply chain. Consulting, cooperating and coordinating activities with others who are involved will make the control of risks more likely and help each party comply with their duty. In fact, this is a mandatory requirement under work health and safety laws when people share responsibility for the same task or the same workplace. It's essential that you have a shared understanding of what the risks of the transport activity are and what each party in the chain of responsibility will do to control the risks. So the slide that you see there lists some of the issues that you should be discussing. If you recall the earlier example about the unsealed shipping container with a poorly secured load, the transport business consults the consignor who then cooperates with the transport business to follow, to, to allow that the container be opened. The consigner, the packer and the transport operator work together on ensuring the loads are properly restrained. 
including the consigner and transporter agreeing to amend the contract. So that's an example of how, of how the parties are consulting with each other, cooperating and coordinating activities. When entering into contracts, you should review the job, discuss any safety issues that may arise and how they will be dealt with. Inform the other parties of your safety requirements and policies. Never assume that someone else in the chain of responsibility is taking care of a safety issue. Check and confirm what others are doing and ensure any contracts clearly specify who's responsible for what. Remember also that you remain responsible for the aspects of the job you influence and control. You cannot avoid your responsibilities by outsourcing them or asking someone else to ensure safety on your behalf. The National Heavy Vehicle Regulator has said they will expect chain of responsibility parties to have a systematic approach to safety. What does a safety management system look like? So a safety management system will help you comprehensively manage the safety performance of your business and comply with safety laws. It may also give your business a commercial advantage and is a requirement for various accreditation schemes. A safety management system is not a safety manual, it sits on a shelf gathering dust. It's an active, continuous process tailored to suit your business and consists of a number of key elements which I'll just go through. So first of all, management commitment and accountability. So effective safety management starts at the top. Those who operate and manage a business need to show that they take safety seriously. So for example, by getting involved in health and safety issues, investing time and money in health and safety, and ensuring safety procedures are followed. It's very important that you clearly assign safety roles and responsibilities and ensure everyone in your business understands where they fit in the safety management system. So you can do this by through, through job descriptions, um, safety policies, and even through organisational charts. The second element is communication and consultation. So identify who needs what information, when they need it, and how that information will be collected, checked, communicated, and documented if necessary. In addition to consulting chain of responsibility parties, the work health and safety laws require that you consult your workers on health and safety issues so that you can make informed decisions. Consultation can be as simple as talking to your workers regularly and encouraging them to ask questions about health and safety, to raise concerns and report problems, and to make safety recommendations and be part of the problems, problem solving process. It's very important that people, that you have a very good reporting culture, a sort of a no blame culture in your business, so that workers feel free to raise um, any health and safety concerns. The third element is risk management. So this is the process that I outlined earlier in the slide. And that really is the driving force behind the safety management system. And again, involve your workers in this process to achieve the best outcome. The fourth element is competency and training. So check the competency of your workers and contractors, including licenses that are required, Use the risk management process to identify any gaps in competency and provide training to ensure workers can undertake their job safely. Managers or supervisors can provide on-the-job training in such things as um, induction of new employees, specific hazards associated with the job, so for example in relation to fatigue management, safe work procedures such as load restraint and emergency procedures. Then we come to procurement and contract management. It's very important that you include safety specifications when purchasing new vehicles and equipment. Also very important is to select contractors with safety as one of your key conditions and specify your requirements. Ask questions and get evidence of their experience or the type of job you want them to do and their safety performance. Ensure that the terms of any contract do not lead to unsafe work. And then we come to security and emergency management. Include a list of the risks arising from theft, assault, sabotage, terrorism, and other criminal acts that could cause harm or damage. 
and the measures you will use to manage those risks. Work with other parties in the supply chain to prevent and respond to security incidents. Again, this was quite topical last week with a truck being stolen. The Australian Government has actually developed quite a useful little short security checklist which is available on the National Security website. Consider the type of emergencies your business could be exposed to. So, for example, fire, explosion, chemical spills, vehicle accidents and medical emergencies. Develop procedures on how to respond quickly and safely when a critical incident occurs. And um, NAPRO is actually in the process of developing some a sort of a template procedure that you could use in your business. Test these procedures at regular intervals to ensure they can be properly implemented if an actual emergency arises and investigate the causes of incidents to prevent recurrence and ensure any notifiable incidents are reported to the relevant authorities. So some types of um, health and safety incidents must be reported to work health and safety regulators. There are also specific record keeping requirements under the Heavy Vehicle National Law. So for example, work diaries and permits. Other records of your safety management system should be kept to help you review your safety performance and to demonstrate compliance with safety laws. So for example, things such as training records and uh, risk registers. Make sure that everyone in your business is aware of your record keeping requirements and also that they know um, which records are accessible and where they are kept. And then finally, regularly review how effective your safety management system is in eliminating or reducing the risks and achieving compliance. Ask your workers on whether and how it could be improved. Now this may seem like uh, a, lot of, um, a lot of work and um, the thing is you may already be, be doing a lot of these things anyway. We've developed a, a checklist to look at um, how your safety management system, how well it's working, and you can download this as part of our uh, presentation. So all up, that's quite a lot of information for our viewers to take in today. Julia, what would you say are the key takeaways for our viewers? So in developing your safety management system, I suggest that you pick a couple of areas to focus on each week and involve your staff in the process. But I suppose if there are a few um, key things that are important enough to take away, it's to consult your drivers and other parties involved in the transport activity on how to ensure safety and deal with any issues. Identify, assess and control safety risks. Monitor and supervise compliance in real time if possible. Test the effectiveness of your control measures and systems regularly. Check your contracts and agreements to ensure they do not demand or encourage unlawful behaviour. Deal with companies able to demonstrate safe and compliant practices and implement record keeping systems and also notify responsible parties as soon as you identify any unsafe conditions, behaviour or non-compliance. So further information on this uh, topic can be found in our new handbook on chain of responsibility um, and I know that some of our members have already received a complimentary copy of that. It also includes a number of checklists and um, templates that you'll be able to use and we are in the process of developing more tools and certainly would value your feedback on what you need in your business. Um, this also includes duties of the new duties of executive officers which I didn't cover in this presentation um, and that's another sort of new element in the heavy vehicle national laws. So I suppose uh, to finalise I would just encourage you to take action now so don't wait until next year. October is actually National Work Health and Safety Month so it's a great opportunity for you to focus on health and safety in your business. So I'm happy to take any questions if we've got any Renee. Yeah, um, we don't have any new questions, but um, if you have any questions for Julia today, please send them in now. Um, we are going to stay on the line for a little bit, um, so we'd be happy to take anything. We have had a few uh, questions come through about recording the session. Um, just to confirm, we, we are recording today's session, so you will be able to access this afterwards 
and share it with anybody else in your business who may have missed it today. Just a reminder, if you do want to make a question, there's a question box just in the control panel of your webinar to the right. Um, while we wait for any questions today, we'll just do a quick review. So as I mentioned, today's webinar will be recorded, so you can review that. Um, you can also download the handouts. So there's a number of handouts that have been um, uploaded into the webinar today, um, including the presentation notes. Um, and you should have received your copy of the, the handbook as well. If you haven't received a copy mailed to you by the end of this week, please um, give us a call or send us an email um, and we'd love to hear from you and make sure that we can fix that up for you. Uh, we do have a question here. Oh, sorry, I think it's still coming from Michael Kennedy. I'll just give that a couple more moments. So just while we're waiting for that, um, we do have some upcoming webinars planned. So we are looking to do a webinar on duties of executive officers in chain of responsibility. Uh, we're also looking to do a webinar on managing contractors because that's a topic that is quite often raised by our members. And we're definitely interested in hearing from you guys. Um, if you've got any ideas, anything that you want us to give you more information on, um, we'd like to start implementing more webinars. So please email them through to info at natroad.com.au. All right, so I do have a question here from Michael Kennedy. Michael says, I haven't read anything about the three year record keeping. Is that in the new rules or where can I find it? The three year record keeping is in the heavy vehicle national law currently. It's in require it's in relation to um, work diaries um, and a couple of other things, but I think it's mainly in relation to to work diaries and the records you need to keep in relation to fatigue. So there is a three year requirement there. Um, but um, otherwise it's it's not mandated for um, other things. There might be things like um, uh, some of the permits and notices, but um, I, I can certainly confirm those and get back to you, Michael. But it, yeah, it, it is in relation to the fatigue. Um, it looks like we might have another question just coming through from Peter Nee. Okay. We had trouble hearing the types of record keeping. Could you please repeat those items, Julia? Oh, okay. So there are record keeping requirements in relation to the fatigue monitoring, so things like work diaries. Um, but there might also be other, I'm actually putting together a list of record keeping requirements at the moment out of the heavy vehicle national law. Um, there are also things in relation to if you get exemptions uh, from certain things, um, permits that you need to keep records of those. So. So I will uh, um, give members a, a list of, of record keeping requirements under the current law. There aren't any new ones that have come through under the chain of responsibility, but um, there will be an expectation that uh, you will keep records of how you know you manage your safety systems. So, so, uh, so when people come in and investigate, they will um, make sure that, or you'll be able to have evidence um, that you have complied. Thanks, Julia. Um, we do have another question here. Um, as far as containers off the wharfs are concerned, I note that as as TPT operators are still in the risk loop, is there is there reasonable steps defence that the container was sealed, etc., which would exclude us? So, as I said, the container being sealed doesn't necessarily mean that you're completely off the hook. So they would be looking at, you know, what was it that could be reasonably practical for you to do, so um, that you know you could, would then go to the person who's responsible for the goods in that container and say, well, are you aware of your duties under the um, chain of responsibility in relation to load restraint? Um, you know, we have responsibility as well. We need to be able to confirm that. Um, the, you know, what's inside the container is properly secured, how can we work together to ensure that um, that actually happens. So 
Uh, and again, you know, if, if the supplies are overseas, it, it doesn't mean that you can say, well, you know, there's nothing I can do. Um, you need to then, the, the, whoever's directly responsible for the goods in that container needs to make sure that then they work with their supplier so that um, they know what the Australian laws require. So, so having a sealed container doesn't necessarily mean, as I said, that you complete your book. You need to um, still, you will still have an element of, of a duty there um, because if you're putting that on your truck and um, you know a, a load falls over, then you will have some responsibility, and they will ask, well, you know, what was it that you were able to do to uh, prevent that from happening? Okay, we have an, another question, <clears throat> pardon me, that was sent in from uh, Maria Ann Cobden. So uh, Maria has asked a question on chain of responsibility. If you suspect a party is uh, contravening in the national heavy vehicle law, who do you contact and when? Is it practical to get the driver to immediately step in or just record the incident to be looked at at a later date? It will depend on how serious the incident is. So when it's a serious incident, you need to have procedures in place to say, and even with the, your supply chain, to say that you know, everyone understands exactly what's going to happen. So that you will have procedures to stop the work. So if it's, as I said, if it's a serious thing, um, the drivers need to be able to say, well, you know, I'm going to stop the work until this is resolved or fixed. Um, for less serious matters, you might say, well, okay, um, we will report, record that, and then, um, you know, liaise with the supply chain. And sometimes it may not be, you know, the direct parties that you're dealing with, but you really need to work through the direct party and then they need to work through the party that they're dealing with um, up the chain. So, and uh, you know, as as I said, record record the report the information to those responsible parties. And sometimes other people won't know that they've got those um, COR duties. So it will be up to transport operators as well to educate um, the people that you're working with about what their duties are. So as I said, it's important right up front to make very clear with whoever you're working with and doing work for, if there is something wrong, how are you going to handle that situation? Okay, we have another question here from Michael Kennedy. Uh, how, do we do, how do we go in the case of DCs where our drivers are, are corralled and cannot observe or direct loading of our vehicles, etc.? So Michael, you might, uh, I'm assuming you're talking about distribution centres where your drivers, and again, this, this comes back to what's reasonable and practical. I mean, if your drivers clearly cannot, are not there to see what's going on, then it's not reasonably practical for you to do um, anything about that. So, but if there is a way for you to um, make sure up front um, with the parties that you work for, um, what their procedures are, what your, your expectations are as well, and then you'll be in a much better position um, to actually also enable your drivers to um, you know, intercept when they see something that's, that's not right. Um, and another one from Michael. Is it our legal responsibility to go back through the chain when it is their responsibility? It, it, again, it's, it's what's reasonably practicable, but you might only be able to deal with the person that, you've, you know, that you're dealing with more directly they will have responsibility then to deal with their supply, with their um, person in the supply chain. So you, again, it's what is practical for you to do. Um, you're not expected to take on their duties. Um, they need to know, um, and ignorance is obviously no excuse, but um, they need to know what their duties are. Um, so um, it's again, it's incumbent on on you to deal with those people that you're dealing with directly, and then making sure that again that they know the other people in the supply chain, um, consulting, cooperating, coordinating activities with them. Okay, uh, we've got another question here from Jeff Bunn. Uh, Jeff says, our system is a well placed, but my question refers to the public who take small loads from landscape yards. How will mass and load restraints be applied to these circumstances, e.g. trailers, small trucks, etc.? And how will the responsibilities in the chain of responsibility function or be applied? 
So um, those people are not subject to the heavy vehicle national law. Um, there are similar requirements for load restraint. I think they're under the Australian road rules um, for light vehicles or things like youths. And, and so members of the public still have an obligation um, to ensure that they're, you know, if they're picking up stuff from a, a yard, um, that it's not going to fall off the vehicle. But it, it doesn't come under the heavy vehicle national law and it doesn't come under chain of responsibility. In WA, it's actually slightly different. Um, WA extends their CRR laws um, to, to light vehicles as well. So there is a difference um, in, the, in the laws in WA. Okay, I think we've got uh, time for one last question today. So um, another one from Michael Kennedy. Um, if you either stopped work or recorded and informed the consigner about breaches and they suddenly stopped using you, would you have grounds for action against them for damages? Michael, I'm not sure about that one. I'll have to go to our legal person that we've got at Nap Road and actually ask them about that. Um, yes, so I, I wouldn't be able to with certainty answer that question. But it's a good question. All right. Well, I think that probably brings us to the end of today's webinar. Um, if you do have any more questions, uh, Julia Collins is available for complimentary information on chain of, the, chain of responsibility sorry, over the phone uh, for Nat Road members. Um, and if you're not a member and you're joining us today, um, you're able to access all this information and more free of charge. Um, give us a call on the number on the screen and we'll be able to help you out with that. Um, and before everybody takes off today as well, um, we'd love to know what you thought of today's webinar. It is the first in a series that we're hoping to start. So any feedback, uh, we'd very much appreciate it. And there will be a survey when you, um, when you exit out of today's webinar. So thank you again. And do reach out if you need anything more for, from us. <laughs>